Okay, so our next speaker is Andy Talkov. I get do that right? Is that close enough? Okay. With the Virginia Historical Society, and he's going to uh, be speaking with you about Lizzie Alsop's nightmare, death and courtship during the Civil War. Sounds like a good one. Let's all welcome Andy. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Thank you, Jack. Um, so the first thing I probably have to say is that uh, locals to central Virginia would pronounce this name Alsop, right? Um, I'm from Massachusetts where we have a tendency to pronounce all sorts of things incorrectly, like Worcester and, uh, and things like that. So just remember Alsop, I might even mess it up as we go along. Um, and I spent, uh, I don't know, maybe two years with Lizzie uh, transcribing her journal. So, um, you know, people would say, oh, Andy, what are you doing tonight? And I'd be like, I'm on my date with Lizzie. So it was a long process. Um, you know, Christie's talk was so big in its scope, and my talk is so minuscule in its scope that I hope it doesn't pale in comparison, but we'll give this a try. So on May 20th, 1862, 16-year-old Elizabeth Maxwell Alsop wrote the first entry in her brand new journal. And during the next 16 years, she filled ultimately nine volumes, uh, which were about 1,100 pages, with her most private thoughts about life and death, love and hate, her successes and failures, and her greatest hopes and darkest fears. Now, Lizzie's journal, and I may be a little biased, but I think Lizzie's journal is pretty extraordinary for a few reasons. There are quite a few reminiscences that were written after the Civil War by women who were teenagers during the war, but there are relatively few diaries that were written as events were unfolding that were written by teenagers. So Lizzie gives us a, a not unique, I mean, of course, it's unique to her, but a, a pretty rare view of what a young woman's view of the events that were surrounding her um, looked like. Also, during the war, Lizzie lived in Confederate Richmond, which we'll talk about in a second, but she also lived in Fredericksburg, and she lived in Fredericksburg while it was both under Union occupation and also under Confederate occupation or Confederate control. So she has a number of viewpoints that she's able to comment on, which makes her journal interesting. And lastly, I think her journal is really accessible to us, to 21st century readers, not only because she writes about universal themes, that really any teenager today could probably relate to, but because she does it with relatively plain language, even though she was remarkably intelligent and well-read, she, her writing is devoid of the overly romantic affectation that a lot of mid-19th century writers sort of take on. So it's sort of plainly written, and she was incredibly honest. So Lizzie's journal, from the academic standpoint, Lizzie's journal offers us a view into the wartime politicization of adolescent women and education practices in the mid-19th century and courtship or dating and religion and the changing relationships between enslaved African Americans and slave owners and the effect of union occupation on southern civilians and also this pretty immense social network that the Alsops put together a century and a half before Facebook. But on a more personal level, we have the opportunity to watch a young woman transform, uh, well, a teenager transform into a young woman who struggles with very common things. She struggles with her anxieties, she struggles with her temper, she struggles with her impatience, which she had a lot of, in an effort to become the thing she wanted to be, which was a disciplined student, a dutiful daughter and sister, 
a faithful friend, a patriotic confederate, and ultimately a submissive Christian. So Lizzie was born into a world of privilege on March 17, 1846. And her parents, Sarah and Joseph, also, um, Sarah's on the, on your, on your uh, right. She's, some would say she's a handsome woman. Um, they were among the wealthiest residents of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, in 1860, Joseph owned $130,000 in real estate and personal property, including 48 enslaved men, women, and children. By 1860, Sarah, Joseph, and their five surviving children lived in a substantial home oh, no, at uh, 1201 Princess Anne Street in Fredericksburg. Lizzie's oldest brother, 22-year-old William studied law, and 21-year-old George was a student of medicine. But the education of their daughters was also important to Sarah and Joseph. And Lizzie, here at your right, and her oldest sister, Nanny, at center, attended the Southern Female Institute in Richmond. Now, I'm sorry you can't see this very well, but Lizzie and Nanny's names, this is the 1860 roster, uh, are the two very first names in the left-hand column. But you might recognize the building because today the site of the Richmond, uh, the Southern Female Institute is at First and Franklin, just a few blocks north of here. Today it's Linden Row um, Inn. And eight-year-old Emily, who you saw in that picture, still lived with her parents in Fredericksburg. So in 1860, the Alsops looked forward to a future of continued wealth and prosperity, but Virginia's secession in 1861 certainly threatened that prosperity. The importance of Spotsylvania County and Fredericksburg in the resulting war completely assaulted it. And spoiler alert, Confederate defeat in 1865 totally unhinged it. So, oops, no, I didn't want to go there. We'll go there. So one of the things you quickly learn about Lizzie is that she was an unapologetic Yankee hater. And she expressed her Confederate patriotism with a fiery passion that maybe only teenagers can pull off. So, for example, while she was at home in June 1862, after being evacuated from Richmond when the Union Army got too close for comfort, Lizzie wrote, we Confederates, generally speaking, are the most cheerful people imaginable and treat the Yankees with silent contempt. They say the ladies of Fredericksburg now bend their necks to walk under the stars and stripe and seem to be of humble and contrite spirits. They little know our hatred in our hearts towards them or the great scorn we entertain for Yankees, underlined. Now, a few weeks later, she was even more blunt. She wrote, I never hear or see a federal private or officer riding down the street that I don't wish his neck might be broken before he crosses the bridge. So clearly, Lizzie didn't really care for Union soldiers. Now, another, you know, in 1,100 pages, another sad and really striking thing about her journal is the almost ever presence of death. Now, of course, there's a war on, right? So we wouldn't. Uh, not expect to see lots of references to friends or relatives who were killed in the course of the war, but she mentions the passing of dozens of people in the course of her journal. Some examples are Hannah's little baby brother died sometime in August, or Chapman Gordon, just 15 years and six months old, one of the brightest promise and engaging, bright and noble, he died in the sweet assurance of peace with God, November 20th. And she even notes this, today Margaret died. Her afflicted mother will accompany her remains to the last resting place, their last resting place tomorrow. And we learn that Margaret and her mother were both also family slaves. So the words death and dead appear more than 160 times in her 1,100-page journal. Now, most are mentioned in passing, no pun intended, 
But on September 3rd, 1863, one of Lizzie's best friends and schoolmates, 17-year-old Hannah Graves of Albemarle County, dies suddenly from what Lizzie calls brain fever. She wrote, Hannah is dead, and I write those dreadful words without shedding a tear, nor a sigh escapes me. But I do mourn for my loss, since I heard that my noble, true friend was lying in the cold, dark grave. Time has passed but slowly. Everything speaks of the dead. She is constantly before me. I long to tell her my thoughts and feelings as I used to do, but... And then she just couldn't write anymore. So it just trails off. Even two years later, Lizzie wrote that she was reading Hannah's last letter to her. Um, and she grieved for her with my whole heart and she put it under her pillow uh, for two nights and said that she dreamed of her. And this is the first time that Lizzie talks about dreaming, which is gonna become important in a minute. Um, but I think it's interesting, you know, this is something we all, all relate to too. We all have dreams uh, and dreams have meaning and you can help me analyze one of Lizzie's dreams later. But Lizzie would comment on Hannah's death in her journal for the next nine years on a pretty regular basis. Now, the other subject that Lizzie frequently wrote about was her dating life, and she had her fair share of suitors, uh, most of whom proved to be pretty unsuccessful. But there was one who made his feelings clear, or who never made his feelings clear, but haunted Lizzie maybe more than others. So just before New Year's Eve, 1863, the Allsops hosted a candy stew. Have any of you ever been to a candy stew before? So basically, this is a pretty popular holiday tradition um, where molasses, in this case probably, or sugar is boiled. And it be when it becomes starts to become cool and sort of caramel-like, two people, usually a boy and a girl with their fingers all buttered up, um, would pull it out between them and then fold it over and pull it out between them and fold it over. And they would do this producing something that's the equivalent of like taffy. Um, and it was a really popular courting event. And so among a number of the many Confederate officers who were uh, at this party was one Confederate colonel named Stapleton Crutchfield. We're gonna go back to him. So born in Spotsylvania County, the 28-year-old Crutchfield was the son of the late Oscar Minor Crutchfield, who had been Speaker of the House of Delegates from 1852 to 1861. Now, I found one reference of him being referred to as Stape, but I'm not going to do that because um, I think it's weird. Um, but he attended the Virginia Military Institute, and Thomas Jonathan Jackson was one of his instructors. Now. How many of you have ever heard of this guy before? I know there are probably two of you, right? Well, three of you. So, okay. So he graduated first in his class in 1855 and stayed on as a professor of mathematics and tactics. Now in 1861, he served for an entire three months as superintendent of the Virginia Military Institute before he joined the Army and served as a major in the 9th Virginia and then the 58th Virginia Infantry. Now, he ultimately, uh, he had some health issues, and so he ultimately was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and served as now Lieutenant General Thomas Jonathan Jackson's Chief of Artillery through the 1862 Valley Campaign. During that campaign, he was captured at the Battle of Cross Keys but the next day was back at his post because in the confusion of all the movements of Union and Confederate troops in the valley, he actually was able to slip away unnoticed and made it back to the Confederate lines. So he was, came to Richmond with Jackson, served in the Seven Days Battles, and then was promoted to the rank of Colonel and kept serving with Jackson as Chief of Artillery at Cedar Mountain, Second Manassas, Antietam, and Fredericksburg. Now at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May of 1863, he was ordering and assisting the movement of guns forward to fire on federal batteries at Hazel Grove and uh, 
was wounded in the right leg, which was ultimately amputated. But here's a little interesting tidbit about Crutchfield. He actually shared the ambulance with Stonewall Jackson that night. And Crutch, there's a, the story that Hunter McGuire tells is that Crutchfield asked if General Jackson was um, seriously wounded. And when he's told yes, he cries out, oh my god. And Jackson orders the ambulance stopped because he thinks Crutchfield is suffering so badly from the jostling of the wagon that he wants to relieve Crutchfield's uh, uh, suffering. So these guys were pretty intimate. In fact, um, Jackson and many others thought Crutchfield should have been promoted to brigadier general, but the loss of his legs sort of curtailed his military career. Other people said that he was a competent officer, but kind of lazy. Jackson, who's notoriously prickly about his officer corps, actually tolerated Crutchfield's tendency to sleep in because he was relatively skilled as an artillery commander. So back to the crutch of our story. Uh, while he recuperated from his wound, Colonel Crutchfield was a frequent visitor at the Alsop home in early 1864, and he and Lizzie were pretty friendly. But Lizzie was entertaining a lot of Confederate officers that winter, and she was particularly preoccupied with Captain John M. Jones, who eventually proposed to her later that summer. Um, her reply in her journal was, I'm sure he loves me truly, and it costs me pain to tell him that he must forget me, for I could never feel otherwise than a friend towards him. Ouch. So meanwhile, Crutchfield goes back to duty and serves as an artillery inspector for coastal defenses beginning in March of 1864. And when he left, he told Lizzie's sister-in-law that when he went back into the field that she should regularly give bouquets of violets to Lizzie on his behalf. Um, ultimately, Crutchfield becomes the commander of the artillery units in the defenses of Richmond. So here we are at the beginning of 1865. Lizzie was 18 years old at the time. M mind you, Crutchfield is 28 years old when they meet, so it's quite an age difference, but this didn't seem to bother a lot of people during the war. Um, a lot of Lizzie's suitors were quite a bit older than she was. And her first diary entry for that year is an appeal to God that before the dawning of 1866, our independence may be won and we at peace with all men. And in March, she continued to express confidence in Confederate success. She said, never has one doubt of our ultimate success crossed my mind. Before the showers of April shall begin to fall, awakening the buds and flowers, a battle must be fought, a victory won. And can I doubt which side will be successful? And then on April 2nd, the Confederates evacuate Richmond, and Crutchfield's gunners join the retreat as an infantry brigade because they had to leave their heavy artillery behind. And while he's leading, now remember, he's an amputee but he's leading an assault against the Union Sixth Corps at Sailor's Creek on April 6th, and he's decapitated by a Federal artillery shell. And his body is never recovered. It probably could be still buried somewhere out near Sailor's Creek. And the Army of Northern Virginia surrenders three days later. Now Lizzie becomes aware of his death on the 22nd, right? So he dies on the 6th, things are in confusion, she finds out about his death on the 22nd. She writes, Colonel Crutchfield is dead. I remember him so full of hope, so certain of our ultimate success. But with him, as every other expectation, we trusted and fought in vain. I cannot say that I wish he was alive. For every Christian soldier who fell in battle during this war must rejoice that they were spared the sorrow of seeing our country's degradation. I think if I were sure of going to heaven and it pleased God to take me himself, I should be glad to die. But I suppose we, what, we must not wish to avoid our troubles, for they are sent as a punishment with us all, but live and bear them. How hard it is, how hard seeing them, our enemies, 
walking our streets, forcing our gray-headed fathers to take the oath, and feeling that our cause is lost, our country subjugated, our army disbanded, nearly breaks my heart. Some people seem to be able to forget, forget our national grief, but it weighs me down and almost crushes me beneath the intensity of its bitterness. She's going through some things here. So through June and July, Lizzie continued to try to come to terms with Confederate defeat. Um, and for Lizzie, a proverbial nightmare has begun, but also uh, as the world that she knew came crumbling down around her, but also Lizzie had some real nightmares. And here we get to the crux of the, of the talk. So on July 10th, 1865, Lizzie wrote, last night I had such a strange, troubled dream that even the remembrance of it oppressed me when I woke. I thought we were having a large party, that the guests were assembling in the old parlor when in the midst of the laughing and talking, Colonel Crutchfield walked in. I remember his taking my hand in his and my saying to him, I'm so glad you were not killed. And then the scene changed. Ladies and, and gentlemen, reputation, please, at 2 o'clock, John Kosky. I'm going to finish by 2 o'clock. And uh, so anyway, she says, I'm glad you weren't killed. Then the scene changed. People are hurrying around. And she said, I know not where nor why. And again, it seemed that Colonel Crutchfield and I were to be married. He's so pale, so ghost-like, and all in black. It's been haunting me all day, and I cannot forget the dream. And for me, Lizzie's nightmare was pretty hard to forget, too. Now, I'm not a dream analyst, but let's just pretend that we are for a minute. So not only is Lizzie mourning the death of her friend, Colonel Crutchfield, which certainly could have just been what was at the core of the dream, Lizzie and the rest of the people around her, uh, at least her intimates, were all mourning the loss of their country as well. And Crutchfield may have been a stand-in as a symbol for both of those things. Now, Crutchfield's appearance in black, no mystery here. Mid-19th century women frequently wore black during the earliest stages of mourning. And Lizzie would have been surrounded by women in Fredericksburg who had lost sons and husbands and fathers. Black would have been a very common dress code in the year after the war. And there were even some Confederate women who wore their mourning clothing in 1865 simply to mark the death of their country. Now, I did look into dream analysis a little bit, and the idea when someone takes your hand is kind of interesting. They, you know, Crutchfield taking her hand may suggest that he was carrying her over to the other side into her own death, which she mentions in relation to him before. And in fact, the, the fact she doesn't resist may suggest that subconsciously she's willing to go. And she literally, in this dream, would marry her passing. Um, and of course, Lizzie, as a, a young woman, uh, was pretty concerned about her love life and the fact that she and Crutchfield were to be married in her dream, something she didn't seem to consider in life, suggests her strong feelings for him and her anxiety about her own future and wish to be married. She'd already rejected by this time four people who proposed marriage to her most recently back in January. And she was going to hold out for true love, but started to question whether it would actually come to her. So nearly a year after Appomattox, she mentions Crutchfield again. She wrote, we are at, in a list of officers who had died. And she writes, we are at peace outwardly only, though. Our hopes are dead. Our cause is lost our country no longer our own. Then I was just 18. Now I am 20 years old and feel sometimes as if 10 years or more have been added to my life since those days that can never come again. And in the next decade, the Alsops would struggle to adapt to the financial and social changes that were caused 
by the war, as well as to the everyday events that happen in all of our lives, and Lizzie documented all of it. It was a world that Lizzie couldn't have imagined back in March of 1862 when she penned that first journal entry. But like most, she carried on, she eventually married and had children, and I'm glad that she left us with this window into a life lived during one of our nation's most troubled times. And I'll leave you with this. It does kind of make me wonder which of our emails people are going to be reading to an audience like you 150 years from now. Thanks.